Y'all, sometimes I just don't know how to start a video. Uh, most of the time I have a great intro planned out in my head. And then sometimes I'm just like, uh, what are words? So I'll just get right to it. Bargello. I want to try it. It's very sunny in here. I've been embroidering for a pretty long time now. I started in 2017, I think. But embroidery is just one form of needlework. And I have a list that I have always wanted to try. I tried cross stitch way back in the day. I didn't like it very much. Sorry, cross stitchers. It just wasn't for me. And then most recently I did a very long exploration of sashiko and apparently put the emphasis on the wrong syllable of that word in the entire video, which made some people want to rip out their hair, I guess. Sorry guys. So the next needlework style that was on my list, one that I have been meaning to try for a really long time, is Bargello embroidery needlepoint. What is it exactly? Terminology has always been kind of an interesting thing in the world of needlework. And like Sashiko, I'm not really here to like tell you the whole story of where this came from. I'm not a historian. I haven't studied this. But I always do lightly do a bit of research because I want to know what the thing is that I'm doing and where it came from. I am almost entirely certain that I am pronouncing the word correctly this time. It is an Italian word. I have lightly studied Italian. And it's one of those words that does not actually mean anything in Italian. Like something I looked up said that it probably comes from the Latin word for like castle or a fortified tower, but it's basically like a name. The term got its name from some embroidery that was found in the Bargello Palace in Florence. Like they found some chairs, it had this flame motif on it, which we'll talk about the motifs in a second. And they were like, we'll call this Bargello embroidery because this is the Bargello Palace. But apparently in Italy, they refer to this stitch style as Hungarian point, but then also there are apparently some British sources of like a very similar embroidery style that calls it Irish stitch. So basically it kind of just seems like nobody knows exactly where this came from, which kind of makes sense if you think about it. You try to like trace this one style of embroidery back to like a single source, but it's not rocket science to be like, hey, what if we did stitches in this specific way? So it's not like crazy to think that multiple people around multiple places in the world came up with the same style of stitching. Anyway, because of the chairs and because they were found in Florence, it is sometimes also called flame work or Florentine work. Lots of names for it. I could not find a solidly reliable picture of these original 14th century chairs. Yeah, all the pictures that I could find of what possibly was the chairs. The embroidery was in a curved motif, at least that's what it looked like to me. And very clearly all the sources say that these original chairs had a flame motif on them, which is why it is sometimes now called flame work. So. So if you are looking at this style and you're like, oh, hey, I recognize that. And my brain says the 70s. Yeah, it randomly had a revival in the 1960s and 70s. Despite being more recent, still wasn't that easy to research like why it suddenly had a resurgence. But I think it might be entirely down to one woman, Dorothy Kestner, might also be Keistner, but I'm gonna go with Kestner, who wrote the book on Bargello and also invented, I guess, four-way Bargello. Bargello. So Bargello is vertical stitches. It's all done like this. Unless you do four-way Bargello, in which case you can do some like this and some like this. So you get this cool pattern that sort of sucks into the center. Apparently you can also do eight-way Bargello, but I literally could not find a photo example of it. So if you've ever seen that, cool. But I, I can understand people latching onto it. It's supposed to be a pretty fast version of needlework, like most embroidery, as you may know, is very slow. I've currently reached like two years of work on a single embroidery project, but this is much faster. It's using a bigger type of thread. It's using a looser weave of material. Wikipedia, 
did say that it's a difficult form of needlework because you have to count, but that seems like somebody's opinion. And I don't necessarily see a ton of Bargello, but I did want to shout out the account or business actually, Hello Bargello. Looking at her stuff on Instagram has been what's kept this idea in the back of my head to like, I should try this. I'm not gonna use her stuff because you know me, I have to just kinda figure things out on my own, but I'll give her a shout out anyway. What I picked up is the book by Dorothy. Um, I don't think these are in print anymore. She wrote two books and this is her second one. I just kinda had to pick which one I wanted to get because yeah, as you can see, like, it's not in the greatest shape. This was published in 1974. Um, possibly because this is her second book or maybe it was just never her thing. She doesn't go into any of like the history or anything about Bargello itself in here other than how to do it. What she does have in here is um, 67 designs. I'm not gonna do all of them. I love working my way through an entire book. That's what I did with Sashiko. Um, I'm not doing that this time. I thought that I would just take the next week, spend every day doing some work and I'll just see how much I can get done in those seven days. Today, I just wanna like get the concept. So Bargello is typically done with wool on canvas. I have a bunch of plastic canvases, which are really commonly used nowadays. I mean, maybe this started in the 60s and 70s. I don't think it was in use in the 14th century. <laughs> but these are pretty common nowadays because they're just easy to sew on. They're more stable and you can turn them into things. Then I also have some, y'all the pronunciations today. I always call this Aida because that's how you pronounce the name of the Broadway. But I think somebody told me it's actually pronounced just Aida? Aida? I like Aida better. And then as far as the wool, I have both tapestry wool and cruel wool. Tapestry wool being a four ply, I believe. And then cruel wool is two ply, so it's a lot thinner. I am almost entirely certain that traditionally you're supposed to use tapestry wool because it's supposed to be a pretty thick boy. <laughs> a thick wool. I read that one stitch covers four threads, fibers. Um, and then the process of moving your stitches so that you don't just have a straight line is called stepping. So if you do like sharp steps where you're offsetting the stitches quite a bit, then you'll get like a sharp diagonal line and that is a flame motif. But if you do small steps where you're just offsetting them a little bit, you're gonna get more of a curved line, which is called a curved motif. Um, the whole motif thing was a little bit confusing to me because like some of the research that I did was like, oh, there's all these traditional motifs. But then other sources, it seemed like that was just the term for how you're moving your colors. So it's basically like there's flame, or there's curved. Those are the two motifs. What you do with them is your choice. And then like Wikipedia said, oh, there's four main motifs, flames, diamonds, ribbons, and medallions. As with pretty much all forms of needlework, it's always really cool to do research on them. It's also very difficult to do research on them. But in the end, like the point is just to have fun and make something that you like, not to like, do it the perfect historical way, at least for me. I'm just gonna have some fun. So let me start today with a bit of testing. Y'all, the sun is moving more and more onto my face. I can't escape it anymore. Let me move locations. Ooh, I hear trotty paws. Hello, you wanna keep me company? Only if you get scratches. <laughs> okay, so I've got some tapestry needles and then I don't think you'd want to put like a knot on the back of here. It would have to be pretty big to not go through here. So I'm gonna assume that the most common way to secure your ends are to stitch over it, is, is to stitch over it. So like you would start your first stitch and just leave a bit of a tail on the back. And then your second stitch would go over that tail as you circle around behind and hold it down and so on with your future stitches. So I did four 
threads of the plastic canvas. And um, I think that's a really big stitch. Also, you can see all of the warp, I guess. It sounds so silly to say that when you're talking about a piece of plastic. You can see all of the ones going this way in between. Let me try two. I mean, you can still just see the in-between. And also, if you're only doing two, you don't really have a lot of options for stepping. I mean, it's not necessarily bad to be able to see the plastic canvas. It just feels like a different kind of thing. Hmm. But before I try something else, I think securing your other end would just involve going back through your stitches on the back. Yeah, that seems right. Um, okay. I actually prefer it on the Ada Ida Aida. I mean, you definitely can't see any of the canvas in Dorothy's work. Oh, hey, look, there were pieces of yarn in the book. Little remnants from whoever owned this and used it before. Okay, so she talks in this book about using four strands or three strands or two strands of Nantucket Needleworks yarn. Persian yarn is one that she talks about using a lot. Y'all, Nantucket Needleworks is still an existing company. Their yarn is six ply, so that is much thicker. But if you look up Bargello yarn right now, you just get tapestry wool. That's generally what most people are using and it is pretty thick. So I'm just wondering, are my plastic canvases like way too thick themselves? What if I just double up? Okay, so if I put two pieces of wool in each hole, that is definitely covering a lot more. I don't think that's the normal way to do it. I think my plastic canvases are just like the plastic itself is too thick. I already ordered normal canvas. It's coming. It's probably gonna get here later today. So starting tomorrow with day one of my Bargello exploration, I'll work with the actual proper canvas and we'll see how that goes. I think I'm just gonna start with a simple design and go from there. And then for absolutely no reason, other than that I thought it would be funny, <laughs> I think I'm also gonna do a random little challenge. I'm gonna try to drink my morning coffee out of anything other than a mug or a teacup. Y'all, I don't know. I don't know. I just thought it would be funny. Okay, okay, let's do it. Day one. We're starting the no mugs and cups week easy with coffee in a bowl. There's a restaurant in New York that serves their large lattes in a bowl. And for some reason, it brought me such great joy. My canvas did not arrive yesterday, but I did make the pilgrimage to Joanne to get more tapestry wool and also got a canvas in the meantime. More on that in a moment. But for now, I'm going to try the plastic canvas that I already have. I wanted to see what a regular yarn would look like on the plastic canvases. And actually this is kind of the perfect amount of width to the stitches to cover the plastic in between. But also it was really hard to pull through the holes, which makes it not a very pleasant stitching experience. I could jump to a slightly thinner yarn, but eh, I'm just gonna do a double stitch with the tapestry wool. The double stitch does make the whole process half as fast, not quite as speedy as normal, but still significantly speedier than the embroidery that I'm used to, and I am quite enjoying it. I think that was a good day one. I actually really, really like it. I do think it's not so bad being able to see the plastic through when it's a color that kind of goes with your color scheme, but I am excited to use the canvas. So what I learned last night when I went to buy more tapestry wool, I was staring at all of their like needlepoint canvases and everything that they have there. And I learned what I should have already known because it's the exact same thing with needle sizes. The numbers work in the opposite direction of what I tend to assume they would. My assumption was that bigger numbers equal bigger holes, but it's the opposite. You gonna leave me? Bye. So it's actually the bigger the number, the finer the weave or the smaller the holes. I got a size 
14, which is a little bit finer than the size 10 that's coming in the mail. And I had a thought, most of the stickers that were on these plastic things, they didn't say size seven, but they all had a seven on them. I think the size is seven and that's why it's so big. Interesting thing to learn. I think this will be a really good comparison. So the size 10 should be arriving tonight. I'm gonna work on that tomorrow. And this was just sort of playing around like I didn't really try to do anything specific. So I think tomorrow I will actually look at an image and try to copy it, something simple. And then from there I can go to something from the book because those are much more complicated. Good day one. Looking forward to day two. I'm quite enjoying it. Day two. Coffee in a plate seemed like a natural progression. My fellow ladies, do you love this style of not quite a bowl, but also not quite a plate dishes? I saw something on Instagram about women loving them and it is so true. I adore these and Matt hates them. Anyway, I feel like an orphan in Oliver. The slosh factor is high, but it does cool quickly. I had some time last night, so I tried out a four-way Bargello design, just copying a simple one I had found in a photo online. It was really fun. Ooh, puppy cuddle time. It was fun. You kind of work in a circle and it flowed well, so good times. My size 10 canvas also arrived and oh look, it's actually size 12. That's on me. I now recall changing my mind on the size at the last minute and then immediately forgetting I'd done that. It's also very springy. Comparing this to the size 14 stuff I got at the store, you can see that they are vastly different and I'm pretty sure that comes down to this one being actual Bargello or needlepoint canvas and this one being Fiddler's Cloth. Fascinating stuff. I'm going to leave the size 12 to flatten under some books and try out a motif I've been seeing a lot on the size 14. I'm just gonna copy a photo again. Dorothy probably has designs like this in her first book, but the second one is much more complex. Perhaps this design is popular because it's sort of a blend of the different motifs. There's some flame, some curve, ribbons around the outside with medallions in the center. I don't have a ton of color choices for nice gradations like this because tapestry wool is proving hard to find in the stores here, but I'll give it my best shot. Okay. Okay, so I think that's where I'm gonna stop for today because I have some other stuff to get done. One medallion. <laughs> it definitely looks, you know, more like it's supposed to look. You can't see any of the canvas through. I did discover a little bit of information that I had overlooked or rather I had looked at it and my brain didn't register anything that it said. So it turns out there's a canvas to yarn chart in the front of this book. And yeah, I, I glanced at it and I was like, I don't understand any of this. Now I understand it. She tells you the mesh size and then the size of all of the types of yarn that she was using. So the Persian yarn is three two ply strands, which means it is thicker than this because this is four ply total. The Nantucket needlework is four two ply strands. So it's double this. So yeah, that kind of, <laughs> tells me something interesting here because for example on the Nantucket Needleworks yarn for a size 12 mesh which is what I ordered it's flattening over there still she says to use six strands and I'm assuming that, that means six of the two ply strands so we're now talking 12 ply right that is way thicker than that that's triple this so yeah I don't know how helpful that is, but it was some interesting information. <laughs> I'm just gonna keep doing whatever I wanna do, let's be real. Good times. And now I'm hungry. Day three, and we're going with a travel tumbler for the coffee. Bit of a cop-out, yeah. But y'all, I booked a background job for the first time in almost a year, wee! My medallion, ribbon, whatever it is Bargello is going to set with me and I'll work on it in the downtime while we're in holding. There's always a lot of downtime. Day four, and how about coffee in a vase? I like this one because it holds a lot more than my typical mug does. And I was welcomed back to background work with a 16 hour work day so I could use all the coffee. We spent most of that time on set rather than in the holding area, so I actually didn't get much done on this piece. Today, I'm in recovery mode. Sit here, drink my vase of coffee, watch some TV, and finish this motif. And of course, cuddle my smallish beast.
That took a few hours to finish up. I really like it, even though this color scheme isn't the most pleasing. I'm gonna have to go dig up some more tapestry wool colors soon, cause meh, my selection's not great. I could not be bothered to stare at my computer screen and edit for the rest of the day though, so I'm gonna move right along to testing the size 12 needlepoint canvas. And I think to do so, I shall attempt the first pattern in Dorothy's book, this scroll one. I've got some shades of pink that I can do with a light orange background, so yeah, let's give it a go. Day five, let's try coffee in a sauce pot. More like a jam pan, actually. I always use this pot for homemade jam. Is a metal container a good idea for hot coffee? Probs not, at least it's got a handle. I got a decent amount done on the scrolls yesterday, so I'm gonna keep working on that. It's definitely faster working on the actual canvas where the holes are so obvious, I guess. Those split seconds you spend on more closed materials trying to find the proper place to bring up your needle, those really add up fast. On the other hand, we're back to the kind of abrasive material that can be difficult to hold onto, so I cut it down into the size I plan on filling in just to make it easier. Okay, two of the four colors done on here. So one thing I am noticing is that the four two step is really sort of the norm in Bargello. Four being the size of the stitch and then two being the number that you step up. So rather than achieving a curved motif or a flame motif by altering that step, like doing a four one step or a four three step, you get that curve or that sharp line by the number of stitches you line up next to each other, but it's all still four two step. So like on this one, this curve is sharper than this curve and that's achieved by just doing different numbers of stitches. So on here we go six, three, two, two, one, one, one. Whereas on this one, it's six, three, three, two, 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 three, three, six. And I looked through the book pretty thoroughly and not every single design is completely 4-2, but most of it is 4-2. And most of the random images that I found online, if you break it down, it's 4-2. Which is just interesting to me. I'm not sure why that is, because you could do 4-1, 4-3, or you could do 3-2. I don't know, you could just, you could do other things, but I suppose the repetition and the really geometric pattern is a lot easier to plan out and a lot easier to get perfect by doing that consistent 4-2. Anyway, observation of the day. I do have some editing to do today, so I'm gonna pause there for now and I will work on it some more later tonight and I'll see you tomorrow. Day six, y'all. I'm going with coffee and a mushroom canister and immediately missing the handle that I had yesterday. Heat conduction, who woulda thunk it? I got the light pink almost finished last night, so for starters, let me get that done. Uh, yeah, that's about it. There's not much exciting stuff happening today. Okay, so, <clears throat> ugh, I haven't talked yet today. Okay, so the pink is all done. So now all that I have left is to fill in all of the background space with my background color. And even though it's bigger areas, she still does all of it with 
the four two step basically. So there are some places where there's gonna have to be a smaller stitch, like right here, that would only be a half size stitch, but she doesn't do any of the stitches bigger just because the area is bigger. So anyway, one thing I think is interesting to note about Bargello, if you just look up Bargello and you don't say Bargello embroidery or Bargello needlepoint, you'll actually get a lot of quilting results. Because apparently at some point, and I don't know when this happened, but at some point in history, quilters looked at Bargello designs and motifs and were like, hey, we could do that with fabric. So Bargello for them, I think just kind of means this style of geometric design that's done with like the long vertical strips. It seems to be very popular. I found mostly quilting results, quite honestly. It was kind of hard to go through and find the actual needlework because it seems Bargello quilting is far more popular at this day and age than Bargello needlepoint. If you've ever made a Bargello quilt, I'd be fascinated to know. What motif did you use? Was it fun? Did you like it? Gotta love the way that art and craft styles morph over the time periods. Yeah, so basically we're just doing that until the whole thing is filled in. Cool. Day seven at last. This is probably the most mug-like container I've used, but it's actually the bowl of a food processor. Hence the reason there's a hole in the center. Ooh, magic. Good morning. So I finished the scroll work last night. Aww. There was definitely one or two places where I miscounted, but you can't even tell. So basically I've done kind of what I set out to do. I wanted to try Bargello. I wanted to try different supplies, different motifs and styles and see what I liked the best. I think the perfect canvas size for this kind of four ply tapestry wool is probably a size 14. So here's what I'm gonna do. I want to start a bigger project. I wanna do one of the ones from the book. I wanna choose one of her really complex patterns and actually stitch the whole thing. Not in this video, but I am going to need some better floss colors and I wanna see if I can find a size 14 canvas. I said I would only have three embroidery projects at a time and this will make four, so already going back on that. But I found a needlework shop that is local to me. It's fairly close. So I think today I'm gonna drive down there and see what supplies they have because honestly, like Joanne and Michaels just don't have a huge selection of the floss colors in the wool. And then these canvases, y'all, they're so hard to find. I'm not finding any of them in stores. So I'm gonna go see if I can find a size 14 needlepoint canvas in a local store because I should do that more. I tend to just go online now because I don't like leaving the house, <laughs> but using a local store is much better. I have one last project that I wanna do in this video, which if I complete it, you'll have already seen, but I just wanna make a little day one, day two, etc. placard for this video. You're so precious. y'all. I am reminded of why I so often do just go straight online to find stuff. That was expensive. It was a really cool store. They had so much thread, floss, yarn, stuff I had never seen before. So like if I'm doing some project in the future and I need velvet embroidery floss, yeah, that was something they had. I'll definitely be going back. But generally speaking, this was way more expensive than I was expecting. I got a good size of size 14 canvas. The 
motif, I guess, or design that I've chosen to do is this one right here. A uh, tough choice. I definitely wanted to do a four-way, like I really like this one, but I wanted to try one of the four-way options and she has some really good ones in here, but I liked the flow of this one. I don't know, it seems cool. So they didn't have any of the DMC or Anchor four ply tapestry wool. Everything else you could think of, none of that. So this was the closest to the size that I could find and it's 50% silk, 50% merino wool. So <laughs> why was this so expensive? That's why. So I'm going with like a turquoise blue, green and purple, four shades of each one. That's about it. This is gonna be another slow project that's going to probably take me many, many months to finish particularly because I always have to jump back and forth between all of my slow embroidery projects, which is why I just wanted to spend a week trying Bargello rather than just immediately jumping in to a long-term project. I really wanted to have a feel for it before I went for something big like this. And it's been really fun. I would not call it a difficult embroidery style or needlework style. If you are a cross stitcher who's looking to branch out, try something new, you will have absolutely no trouble with it. You're basically already there. If you are somebody who's never embroidered before, I think it's a great version to start with, particularly if you really like those kind of geometric designs. I'm already thinking about like, what can I put this on as far as clothing goes? It's also a great option for kids. I mean, I don't know anything about childhood development, but like, learning patterns and counting and repetition seems like something that would be good for certain ages of children. I don't know what that age is. But also on top of that, because you're embroidering on a canvas, particularly if you just gave them like the plastic canvas, you don't have to be using a sharp needle. You could full on give them a uh, plastic needle with no sharpness to it whatsoever. So it would also be like a really safe version for kids to do. And not that he's a kid, but Matt actually embroidered some of uh, this piece. So yeah, if you have no embroidered experience whatsoever, so ever, and you're looking for something to get started with, Bargello is a great option. This has been fun. I love learning a new embroidery style. If you have any embroidery styles or needlework styles you think I should try out, do let me know. I already have a bunch on my list, but I'll always add more. Oh, and my favorite coffee mug replacement was actually the vase. It kept my coffee warm for a really long time. It held a lot of coffee and it didn't burn my hands. Later taters! Well that's not gonna work. So much sunlight right in my face. We tried. That was fun. What's that for? What? That. What? This. What? Here. What? The tea. Hmm. Soup?